getting to somebody who will sing. Now, I usually ask our church this when we sing this at, uh, inside the uh, worship area. But how many of you, because we may have some new folks among us tonight, how many of you are here tonight with a friend, family member that's in hell? Yes, just about everybody. Now, I know when we come to church, we're to worship God, and that's what we're here for, and that's what we should do. But as we sing that third verse, I want you to think about that friend, that family member that's in heaven tonight. I love that third verse. I heard about a mansion Amen. he has built for me in glory. Yeah. Sing with us now. Amen. I heard about a mansion he has built for me. So he was explaining to me, you know, a little bit, and I said, you got to get up there and tell the people what you've told me tonight, because there's a vast difference between the hearing people and the deaf people. They live a totally, totally different life than what you and I can hear uh, live. So Brother Adam, why don't you come on up here and uh, share this with everybody. Good evening. Good evening. So happy to be back. What a wonderful night yesterday. Amen. I want you to think about. I'm going to say something. I want you to pay attention, and then I want you to to copy what I say. Okay? It's pretty, very simple, very simple, very trainable exercise. Okay? Pay attention. It goes like this: Deaf people are not hearing people who cannot hear. Okay? I'll say it again. Deaf people are not hearing people who cannot hear. Okay, I want you to think about that, and I'm going to explain why that's true. Okay? It, and I guess I have many stories about when I was when I first got involved in ministry. And one of the stories was I said to a pastor, I said, Hi, my name's Adam Wells, and I preach to the deaf. And he said, brother, I've been preaching to the deaf for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. 
So no meeting there. <laughs> so then I went to the next pastor. And I said, hello, preacher. My name is Adam Wells. I'm a missionary to the deaf. I preach to the deaf. He says, you know, brother, he says, boy, I'm so excited about your ministry. I think that everybody should hear the gospel. <laughs> you know, the deaf, the blind, the crippled, you know, preachers, you know, everybody should hear the gospel. Everybody. Okay, but I want you to stop. One of the things we need to do as Christians, and he said this, uh, but Brother Long, Danny Long said this. He said, we need to think. We need to think. What did he say? He said that everyone needs to <laughs> the gospel. Yeah. Right? Because faith cometh by yeah. and hearing by the word of God. So what if you can't hear? See? If you go on to the yes. next verse of that, you know, in Romans chapter 10, you know what it says? It says the sound went out. Right? It says the sound went out to the whole world. And I understand the application to the Jews rejecting the gospel. I understand that. But you understand there are people in this world for whom sound is <coughs> pointless. Yeah. Okay, this? Victory in Jesus, it does something in your heart. There is a spiritual, real, physical, godly response in your soul to a song like that. Yeah. I cannot interpret that. Yeah. I can't interpret that. Amen. Whatever happens in your soul when that music gets you ready for the preaching, I can't interpret that. I can just interpret the words. Yeah. See, there's a difference. And, and in, in, in Mark chapter 7, I mentioned this yesterday, th there's this deaf man that Jesus takes aside. Okay? But you know... In, in Luke chapter 18, there's a story of a, of a blind man that gets saved. And you notice there's a big difference between these two stories. And here's what it is. When the blind man, the blind man hears the tumult. He can't see, but he asks what's going on. Yeah. And the people say, hey, Jesus of Nazareth is coming this way. And he says, Oh, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. He cries out. They say, Shut up. He cries out the more. Right? Jesus, Son of David. And then Jesus actually speaks to him and he says, Well, what would you what do you have me to do? He says that you restore my sight. Question. How did he know that there was a tumult? Yeah. He heard the tumult. Okay, how did he know that Jesus of Nazareth was the son of David? Somebody had told him in a way he could understand that Jesus of Nazareth was the son of David. How did he know that Jesus could heal his eyes? Somebody had told him. See, you don't have these details in Mark chapter 7. There are no details. He's deaf. He sees this big thing going on. There's some guy and all these people are following him. But what for? He has no clue. And so the question is, here's the question. I promised you I'd bring this back. I found it. This is the track 11 years ago that a deaf soul winner, Amen. a deaf soul winner, Amen. That was concerned about the hearing. Amen. That was reaching out with the gospel. Amen. Gave me and changed my life. Amen. That's it. Preach is good, brother. Amen. Yeah. I love it. But here's the question. How do you start from a not saved deaf person and get to a God-serving, soul-winning, faithful Christian deaf person? And so think about this. I've got a story to explain it. It's not that easy. And I share this with Brother Jack. It was about eight years ago. Maybe nine years ago now. And there was a deaf boy. His name was Carmine. Carmine. Now Carmine grew up in a Catholic family. And in Cincinnati, 
Besides Cincinnati. Because of the baseball hat. Cincinnati. But we don't like that sign because it's too much like this. They're <laughs> <laughs> laughing at you. But he grew up in Cincinnati in a Catholic home, and, and they have a they have a Catholic deaf school called St. Rita School for the Deaf. Okay? He's about 16, 17 years old, junior, senior. And at that time, he had mainstream. He was going to the public school with an interpreter. He came to our church, and he was watching the choir practice the same song you're going to see tonight. And he was watching it, and it really was touching his heart, but he didn't understand why. And he comes up to me, and he sees there's this sign that he sees. It looks like this. And he says to me, what does that mean? I spelled Lord. L-O-R-D. And he says, what does that mean? Lord. He said, what does that mean, the word Lord? What does that mean? Okay, he grew up in a Catholic school. You would think he had seen that sign before. Yeah. But no one had sat down and explained to him who God is. Yeah. You understand that? Yep. And so here's this boy, and we sit down together, and I'm kind of explaining who God is, the creator, the giver of life, the one who controls your heartbeat tomorrow. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, that's who we serve, the living God that's in control of everything. Amen. He didn't know. And about two months later, from those seeds, they grew. And he got saved Amen. in our church. Amen. And he was able to grow quite a bit before we left. And we were very thankful for that. But you see, that's the problem out there. And many people are just assuming that if you just have an interpreter, that they understand every word that comes off of those hands. And that's not the case. You think about this as you grow up and you learn how to read. How do you learn how to read? Phonics. Yeah. Right? PH phonics. You sound it out. Hey, hooked on phonics don't work for me. Right. You can't sound it out if you're tiki. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. See? So all these words, all these English words. They have to be explained conceptually in pictures, in a, in a moving, in a living way so that she understands just like you do. But you understand for her it's a lot more work. Yes, yes. Because you just understand it because God blessed you enough to be able to hear and you grow up with it. Yes, amen. How many things do you know by virtue of the fact that you can hear? Right. Things that you've heard so many times you just remember them. Don't touch that, it's hot. Like, no. Those things that you hear. Just think about that for just a minute. And, uh, and so it is a different culture. Because they're so separated, because they learn differently, because they think differently, they tend to isolate themselves together. And as they have been isolated, the culture has grown up. They're very tight knit. They're very tight knit. And they hold together. And so I'd encourage you to think of that. We need to open our minds to that because it's true that deaf people are not hearing people that cannot hear. We want to sing about heaven tonight. Is that all right? If we sing about heaven? Yeah. You want to sing about Morgan going to heaven? Yeah. yeah. Morgan, that was the name of the girl. Yeah. Morgan, she got saved yesterday. Amen. Somebody ought to shout right there. Yeah. Yeah. Your eternity has been changed forever because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Because the church that cared enough to have a revival on a cold, rainy, tent covered, kind of leaky yeah. Tuesday night. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. So we're going to sing about that heaven she's going to go to. And then we're going to show you that song I was telling you about with Carmel, okay? This song is called Beulah Lane. Oh. Oh, sweet. 
keep your mind and heart for mission. Amen. Yes, sir. Because one of these days, people will say thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'm sure uh, Morgan last night got saved when we get to heaven. Her husband said thank you. Yes. Support. Support missionary. Amen. Support. Keep on pushing. Don't quit. Don't quit pushing. Keep on pushing. Because one of these days, we're going to get married. Amen. Amen. I'll be one pound. Yeah. yeah.
so glad you gave. people's lives whom we've touched. And that's just a perfect example of what it will be like. Because people from all over the world will come to us and they will say thank you for sending a missionary our way. That's what God wants us to do is to get the gospel out to everyone everywhere. Amen. Fred, I'm going to ask if you would please bring... Uh, Take you back with you and Adam, and I want you to sign this song we're going to sing as a congregation, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Can you do that? Line up right here, because here's what I want to do. We're going to sing it. I want you to watch them sign it. And then on the second verse, now listen, on the second verse, Jamie and Reba, I want you two to sing that verse by yourself. Okay? Can you do that? On the second verse. I do not want you to sing on the second verse. I want you to hear them sing. Watch them sign, and then on the third verse, and that's going to get us started, and then we're going to, she's going to stop playing, and we're going to sing an acapella. All right, everyone stand with me tonight. Everyone stand with this.
Steve, it's track five. Okay. Thank you.
Hallelujah. Pastor, if you want us to dismiss and go home, that'd be all right. Man, I have. My cup is full running over. Boy, when you saw them up here rejoicing. I, I know, I, I know they were, forgive me, forgive me. I know they were active in a sense. They were. They were showing us what it's like for them. I understand that. But I, it looked real to me. Yeah, amen. Or to think that one day we're going to be in heaven. And even there, it ain't going to be about us. It ain't about us down here. It's all about Him. Brother Fred, we're going to get to cast our crowns at His feet. Amen. Oh, I tell you, God is so good to us. God is so good. I, I tried to say something kind of like what Brother Adam said tonight about he couldn't interpret the sound and what happens with that sound. I was trying to say something like that last night as I was talking about the devil. I, did, I didn't have words to say it right. Amen. But you know, I, I think about it. We are so blessed. The, the sounds at, that we hear has a lot to do with our lives. They influence us so much. And uh, I guess the, the bad thing for us is a lot of times those sounds take us away from the Lord. That's right. Amen. Amen. We were, while well, things were going on, I don't know if you paid any attention or not, but they were up signing. The train was going through. It didn't bother them at all. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, wait, wait, y'all. You're not putting the spiritual application there. The things of the world didn't bother them at all. No, right. Oh, not that, that be the way it is with us that are hearing? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You're right, brother. Amen. That's right, man. Oh, I, I wish we'd just get in tune with the Lord. Yeah. It's been good to be with y'all again. Well, yeah. friend, thank you so much. Amen. Boy, I tell you, our hearts are rejoicing tonight. Open your Bible to the book of Mark, Mark chapter number 2. Mark chapter number 2. I appreciate you coming tonight. I know it's not uh, real comfortable here tonight. I know that some of you are cold and others are chilly and others are lying if they say they're not. <laughs> Amen. It'll get warm. But uh, I thank you for coming tonight. I really do. And I, I pray that no one gets sick from this. <clears throat> some of you may get sick of it, but I hope you don't get sick from this. Amen. But it is a joy to be here tonight, and I appreciate it. I don't know if I would come if I wasn't preaching. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I sat many time under a tent when it was over 100 degrees. I wasn't preaching. I sat under tents, my friend, where you had a big, thick coat on and a blanket on and still shivering. Sit there and just enjoy the service. I wasn't preaching. Yeah. Amen. God sure is good, isn't He? Mark chapter number 2. You stand with us tonight as we read. We're going to read it. Go back and see what God's got for us, alright? Mark chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, and again, He, talking about Jesus, entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that He, Jesus, was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And He preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in His Spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, He said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, 
or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that he that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them, uh, went forth before them insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we thank You tonight for the many blessings You've given to us. Thank You, Lord God, that one day You came our way. And Lord, You spoke to our hearts. And Lord, there we heard that sound. God, we heard You as You spoke. Lord, it wasn't with an audible voice as we think of, but Lord, You spoke to our heart. Dear God, I thank You tonight, Lord, that when You spoke, we yielded. And Lord, You became our Savior, Amen. the Lord of our life, our soon-coming King. We thank You tonight. We thank You for Your precious Word that quickened us and made us alive in Jesus Christ. We thank You, Lord, for the power of the Word that it has upon us today, Lord, that it keeps us walking the straight and narrow pathway. We pray tonight, Lord, that once again You'd speak to hearts. We pray, Lord, that those that are lost here tonight would come to know You as their personal Savior. We pray that Christians tonight would realize, Lord, God, what an awesome responsibility You've given to us to take this Gospel to others that have never heard the Gospel. Lord, maybe if we should say never even seen the Gospel. Lord, we just pray, God, that You'd make us so mindful of this. And Lord, that we'd want to get the Word out around the world that Jesus saves. Lord, would You help us tonight? God, would You preach to us tonight? Lord, it's an honor to be Your servant. Lord, help us to serve You tonight, Father. We're weak and we're frail. God, the, the very best we can do, Lord, we still are failures. But God, would You help us tonight, Lord? Father, Father in our feeble way that we could obey You and get the message out You want out tonight. Lord, do that work in our hearts that only Your Holy Spirit can do. We'll thank You for it. We'll praise You for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. We look here in Mark chapter number 2. It's obvious from reading in verse number 1 that Jesus had been in Capernaum before. He had been there preaching and healing and doing the things that Jesus did. And he had left for a little while and now He's come back and folks have heard about Jesus. Amen. They had heard about how He had healed the blind as uh, Brother Adam said tonight. How He had healed the blind and how He had uh, gave those that were uh, uh, dumb uh, the ability to speak and how He had raised the lame up to walk and all of these things. They had heard that. And so the Bible says there in verse number 1 again that He entered into Capernaum after some days and it was noised that He was in the house. Word had got out that Jesus is in the house. Amen? That, listen folks, that's what we need to be doing this week. God has given us an opportunity you see, we, we, uh, we're not sure about revival, okay? We've got different definitions of revival, what revival is. And, I, and I'm not sure that we're wrong in that, to be honest with you. Revival means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And, uh, but, but I think sometimes we miss the mark of revival because we don't use it to, I'll say to our advantage, we don't use it to our advantage. You see, a revival could be a time that God's given us to get it, reach out to others that will not go to church, or, you know, on a Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, and invite them to something we call a revival. Right. Amen. It's a time. Now, especially here, and, and I mean that, uh, Pastor, I, I, I mean, God has given us a, the, a, a, just a wonderful opportunity to reach out to folks and say, won't you come to our revival? We're having a tent revival. Yeah. A tent meeting. Now, now folks, look, there's a lot of folks that have never been under a tent before. Yeah. I'm talking about around this area right here. Yeah. Every area you go into, there's a lot of folks that have never been. Uh, there, some of them would say, well, I've heard of those, yeah. but they've never been. Amen? Yeah. And it's a, it's a great opportunity that God has given us, and we ought to use that with our families. Amen. Right. 
Right. We ought to use it with our families to get them to come and be with us and sit under the tent with us and encourage them to be here. Why? I'll tell you why we ought to do it. It's because Jesus is meeting with That's us. That's right. Amen. 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 That's the reason we're here, isn't it? Yeah. We don't come because Brother Danny's preaching. No, yeah. Amen. We don't come, my friend, because Brother Fred and them are here. Right. Amen. We don't come because of the special music and, and all of that. Folks, listen to me. That's not the real reason we come. You right. say, oh, we do. I do. I came because of... No, no. In, in reality, if you're saved, you came because Jesus is meeting with us. Right. This, if the Lord doesn't show up under this tent with us, folks, we're wasting our time. Amen. It's a, just a total waste of time. But I'm telling you, and if you've been here, you already know it. The Lord has been meeting with us every service in, under this tent. Amen. Amen. And so we, what we need to do, we're, we're kind of coming up short on this thing because we're not getting it noised around about that Jesus has been meeting. You see, a lot of times we do get a little bit confused and we say, Boy, you ought to go down there uh, and meet with us, man. We're having the time under that tent. Uh, we got a one-handed preacher down there that's preaching, and, and he, he's not real sharp, but you ought to come in here. Now listen to me. That may draw a few folks, but it won't draw like telling folks that Jesus that's right. is meeting with us. You know why? Listen to me. All I can do is speak to where we can hear with this way. And beyond that, I cannot help and do anything. But the Lord Jesus Christ can reach in the heart of a 14-year-old girl. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And save her soul. Yeah. Literally change her life. I, folks, we're, we're watching last night. Amen? Yeah. We didn't really we didn't see what went on. No. We saw her come forward. We saw her kneel and pray. We saw her get up. We heard the testimony that she had accepted the Lord. But there was a change in that young girl. Amen. You say to them, well, how do you know? Did you talk to her? Anybody that gets saved, there's a change in yeah. them. Amen? Yeah. And, it, and what that change is going to do, now it's going to start showing up in her life. Right. Amen. Amen. I found out when you get saved, it changes everything about you. It changes your attitude. And boy, does some of us need to be saved. <laughs> Amen. It'll change our attitude. I mean, it'll change our whole way of thinking. It'll change our way of living. It just changes everything about us. That's what salvation is. The Bible says that we become a new creature in Christ. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Amen. It was noise that Jesus was in the house. Folks, we got to get the word out that the Lord... We, we got one more night. Praise the Lord, we've got one more night. Amen. It could come to an end tonight. Amen. But we're planning on one more night. And what we need to do tomorrow is we need to get the word out that Jesus is meeting with us under this old-fashioned tent. Amen. The Bible says here, said it was noise that he was in the house. And look what this brought about. And straightway, many were gathered together insomuch there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Now, we say, well, Brother Danny, but, you know, we get the word out, and folks, I, I mean, they don't, they don't respond like they did back in those days. You know why they don't respond the way they did back in those days? Because we, we, don't, we don't know as it abroad that Jesus is meeting with us. It's like I said, we say, you ought to come and hear the preacher. You ought to come and hear the singers. Well, people don't want to hear that. Big deal. They can hear singers all the time. They turn on the TV and hear preachers. That's right. That's true. That's true. Jesus makes the difference. And the problem is, church, we've gotten away from that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. We've gotten away from the fact that Jesus is the one that makes the difference. Amen. It's not the preacher. I'll say it again. And it's not the singers. My friend, it's not this and it's not that. It's Jesus Christ that makes the difference. That's the reason you can meet on your tent. You can meet in that building. You can meet in a in a big old, we'll call it a church building. It don't matter. It's all whether Jesus is there or not. Amen. 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 They, people begin to gather. They had heard these things. Now listen to me. Not all of them were believers in Jesus Christ. 
Some of them came as those that was just going to look on. They had heard the many things that he had done. They just wanted to be around there and see it happen again. Amen. We're going to have that. Praise God. Because sometimes when those come just to look on, they get involved. God speaks to their heart. Amen. Right. And here they are. There's a crowd, the Bible says, in so much that there was no room to receive them. I mean, there wasn't a place for them. You said, Brother Danny, last night you said something about, you know, the crowd sometimes can be a hindrance. Amen. It can. But that, listen to me. Sometimes it takes to get the crowd to get one saved. What we need to do, we don't need to be trying to get the crowd. We need to be trying to get the individuals. Amen. Jesus would get the crowds together. When He got to preaching to the crowds, the crowd would leave. But usually somebody would believe. Amen. They gathered together, the Bible says, and there's no room uh, to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And He, Jesus, preached the Word unto them. He preached Himself. Jesus is the Word. Amen? Right. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. Jesus is the Word. So when He got up to preach, He preached Himself. He preached about Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. He just preached the Word. Folks, now, we're living in a day, a day and time where we get, we're trying to come up with gimmicks to get folks in. Yeah. I, I, now listen, I, I, I shared part of my testimony with you last night, but... God used a girl to get me to go to church. I'm not opposed to giving somebody bubble gum to get them to go to church or a hamburger. Amen? If somebody is, uh, well, they just don't have a brain to think with. It. So they say, oh, they, they used all kinds of gimmicks down there. We use that to get folks here so that we can give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Listen, but sometimes, you know what we do? We change our programs around and to where all we've got to offer people is the gimmick. That's all we got going for. Do you realize a lot of the big churches, that's the reason they're the big churches, because they, they can afford the gimmicks. And the gimmicks is what's got them there. And the gimmicks is the only thing that keeps them there. And when folks get tired of the gimmicks, they leave. Amen. Folks, we've got Jesus Christ to offer. Amen. And I'm glad, praise the Lord, He's not a gimmick and He goes with us. Amen. Right, amen. I mean, wherever we go, He goes with us, praise the Lord. Right. And, and what I like about it, if you say, well, He's the same as a gimmick, well, let me tell you, He came into my life in 1969 and He's still there. Right. Amen. 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 You won't find a gimmick that will last like that. Nope. Amen. I'm talking about the person, Jesus Christ. Yeah. But the Bible says that and he preached the word unto them. Amen. And then he goes ahead and he says in verse 3, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So here, here all of a sudden we find that, that here's Jesus. He's come into this house. Now we've got to understand this. It's not a church house that we think of. Uh, because they didn't have church houses like that back in those days. I know they had a synagogue and all of that kind of stuff. But he would go to someone's home. And he was in a house, a literal house. And he was up there preaching. People gathered around and uh, the Bible says there was no room to receive them. I mean, they couldn't stand in the doorways. There was so many already there. There was just no place for them. And all of a sudden, uh, here comes four guys. They're, they're bringing their friend to Jesus. Amen. I mean, listen, sometimes we get satisfied with just going to church myself. Amen. I wish that I wish it didn't bother me. You bother me. Yeah. <laughs> but Jesus is preaching to them, and here comes these four men, and they're they're bringing their friend. I said sometimes we get satisfied with just going to church ourselves. Well, never be satisfied with going to church just ourselves. What all want to get somebody else to go with us. Amen. These four men, and I said four friends because I believe they were. These four men, they, they heard about Jesus. I don't know who they were. I, I've heard speculation as to who they were. Maybe one of them was a blind man. Had been blind. And he got his sight back. Maybe one of them was a, 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 a man that could not speak and God had 
touched his tongue and, and now he could, he could speak and, and on and on. I, maybe as a leper, one of them could have been a leper that had been healed from leprosy because Jesus had just done that. Amen. I, I don't know, but they knew Jesus and they knew the power that the Lord Jesus Christ had, my friend. And they had this friend that was lame. He could not walk. My, boy, I'm telling you, they begin, I see them as they begin to think about their friend who can't walk. And they decided the best thing we can do for our friend is to get him to where Jesus is. Amen? Folks, listen. We call ourselves friends. We call ourselves family. And we never do all that we can do to get others to come to Jesus. Amen? Some of us, we say, well, I've got lost loved ones. Would you pray for them? Listen, I believe in prayer. Thank God for prayer. But sometimes we need to do a little more than pray and we need to go get them. Amen. Amen. We need to, we really need to latch on to them and stay after them. You say, well, I don't want to run them off. Where are you going to run them off to? There's only hell one. There ain't hell two and hell three. Where are you going to run them off to? Yeah, but I don't want to. Hey, listen, with that attitude, they'll die in their sins and go to hell because you don't want to, here's the word you're looking for, offend them. My friend, listen to me. I got offended the night before I got saved. By the Word of God, I was offended. Amen. Because I was lost. And the Word of God offended me. I got upset and mad and left. Amen. Wasn't going back. So don't worry about it. You see, God's got a way of taking that offense and turning that thing around to where it becomes a blessing. Yeah. Amen. Our problem, folks, is that we're looking for an excuse to keep from keeping on after somebody to get them to come. That's our problem. We're just wanting an excuse. And so we, we say, well, I don't want to offend them. I don't want to run them off. I don't want to make them mad. Look, I'm not talking about getting in their face and telling them they're going to hell. I'm talking about staying after them, about going down to the church. You see, listen, folks. The best thing we can do, the best thing we can do is we witness to someone, we tell them about Jesus Christ. Now, another way of getting it done, I said the best way is us telling them. But another way of getting it done is at least invite them down to the house of God. Amen. Amen. Yep. Amen. Folks, listen, if we we'll stay after them and we stay after them, I have heard people that have stayed after their loved ones and stayed after their loved ones, and finally that individual says, okay, okay, I'm going to go just to get you to shut up. Amen. What? I say hallelujah. Yeah. Thank God somebody is consistent. Amen. Somebody is staying on their trail. Well, here, here these, these men, I don't know the, the situation. The Bible doesn't tell us all about it. But they go and they get their friend. I, I don't know. He may have not been a volunteer. I mean, they could have went to him and said, hey, listen, Jesus is preaching down the street here. Uh, and oh... Fred's house and, and we want you to come and go with us and he may have said, I don't want to go. Now, I can I can see that where a man is on the bed of affliction and maybe he hasn't had a bath in a long time and maybe the blanket on over him is nasty and dirty and all these things. I mean when I think back in the Bible days I can see that happening. <laughs> hey and, and and he probably used this. I don't have a thing to wear. <laughs> Huh? Yeah. Oh, I don't have the right clothes to wear to go down there to the church house or, or to that house if Jesus is preaching. Evidently, these men didn't take no for an answer. And he may have never said yes. They might have just very well one on each corner of that cot, that bed, picked it up and took off with him and him saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't know. But it could have happened that way. But their concern was this. Getting him to Jesus. Yeah. They were looking at this man. As, he's lame. He's, he is helpless. He is hopeless. There's nothing we can do other than we can get him to Jesus. And if we can get him to Jesus, whoa, something good can take place. Yeah. I mean, if we can just get him down to where Jesus is, 
Jesus can take care of his situation. They had faith to believe that, my friend. I wish we had enough faith to believe that for our loved ones' sake. We say we do, but we don't. We don't go after them. We don't take them up into church. We don't insist that they go. You say, well, we can't do that. Who said that? I'll tell you who told you that. The devil did. Because he don't want you getting them there. And we listen to that devil. We listen to it. We don't want to make them mad. How mad do you think they're going to be when they get to hell and realize you as a Christian the whole time and didn't even tell them? They're going to get upset. I figure that man, that rich man over there in the book of Luke that died and went to hell. Remember the story? Him and the beggar, the beggar died. Angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. That rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes and gave him torments. And the Bible says he, he is speaking to Father Abraham and he said, send Lazarus back that he may speak to my brethren. I have five brethren at home. Go tell them lest they come to this place. You know what I kind of think? I kind of think maybe he was big brother. He never, maybe he had heard the gospel. Lazarus laid at his gate. I, I would think Lazarus had told him about Jesus. I'm serious. My friend, listen to me. Now he's crying. Why would he want Lazarus to go back? Hey, listen, he knew Lazarus would get the job done. He'd already been telling him about it. And, and I believe that this man did not want his brothers to come down there because he had never told them about Jesus. And who, he knew there was no love in hell. He's there. There's no love in hell. My friend, listen to me. We, we better get busy about our loved ones. We better get more concerned than just saying we're concerned about our loved ones. They're going to die in their sins and go to hell. If we, how can we that are saved knowing that heaven is our home? Hallelujah. Thank God we'll never have to suffer any of the things of hell in that wonderful but way. How can we that are in that position never even consider those that are not? How can we do that? When Jesus came from heaven to earth because we were in that same situation and yet He loved us so much, He came that we might have the gospel. To be saved. Folks, we, we're shunning our responsibility. Oh, oh, wait, we're so busy making a living for our family. That's our responsibility to make a living for our family. And we're so busy with that, we can't we can't stay after our family. We can't stay on them about going to church. We we've got all these other things that we must do. I've got a feeling that when we get to heaven, all these other things are going to seem so small. They're not going to amount to anything. These four men looked at their friend and they saw his situation that he was in. They saw themselves being able to walk and talk and get around. They saw themselves being able to go to church, go to the house where Jesus was preaching, go to other places, and they saw their friend unable to do that. And they wanted him to have what they had. Amen. They knew Jesus. They wanted their friends to know the same one. So they go get him. And they bring him down to the house where Jesus is. As Jesus is preaching, they get him there. Folks, listen to me. No one said this is an easy task. Yeah. They get their friend to Jesus or get him to the house. They get to the house. There's a crowd there. I mean, you can't get him up to the window. You can't get him up to the door. There's a crowd there. Uh, they can't get him to where Jesus is. You know what most of us, here's, here's what we do. We invite folks one time, and if they say no, yeah. what are you doing? Washing my hands of them. I tried. It's over with. I can see these men as they get there. They're carrying this, this, this man on a bed. They get him there. The crowd is there. And they look at him and say, Well, oh, we had such high hopes. We just thought if we could get you here and get you to Jesus that he would heal you. But as you can see, there's a crowd. We'll see you later. Wait. That's the way we do our loved ones. I tried. God can't say I didn't try because I tried. 
they brought him this far. They wasn't going to let the crowd stop him. They weren't going to let, listen, they weren't going to let circumstances stop him. They weren't going to let the situation stop him. He was still in need. Even though he couldn't get to Jesus, he was still in need. Don't we understand that our loved ones are going to die without Jesus? And they're going to a hell that is eternal? Listen, folks, we get so so heavenly minded sometimes we're no earthly good. Yeah. 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 Amen. We get to, oh, praise God, we're going to heaven. Hallelujah. Whoa. Amen, brother. Praise God. Amen. Amen. We're going to heaven. Praise God. What about those that are not? I say let's keep rejoicing over going to heaven. Amen. I, there's not a thing wrong. As a matter of fact, the Bible, he, God tells us to do that. Amen. But at the same time, you see, the, part of the rejoicing is so that we might rejoice in front of our loved ones to get them to come to Jesus. Amen. Oh, we've lost our burden. We preach a lot of times about losing our joy. I'm going to tell you what we've lost that we haven't recognized. That's our burden. We're not burdened for lost anymore. I remember when I first got saved, it was nothing to go to church and be in church. Invitations given. The altar fill up with Christians. I've seen some old moms and dads down on their face before God in an altar of prayer, weeping and crying and calling their children, calling their grandchildren, calling out the names of loved ones, calling out the neighbor's name in that altar of prayer, crying and weeping before God, asking God, begging God, pleading with God that God had saved them. Now, have you noticed our invitations? We can't even get Christians to come to the altar. We wonder why we don't get lost folks to come. We can't even get Christians to come to the altar. Lost folks, they don't want to feel out of place. And they're out of place if they go to the altar and there's nobody else there. I'm Christians, I'm telling us, we got to we, we, we have shunned our responsibility yeah. and that is to pray for others. Yes, we have. Amen. Man, I, I think about uh, the, the deaf people. Man, we have, you know, listen to me. The average church, if you go talk to them about a deaf ministry, they're, they're just going to look at you. Yeah, well, I can see that's a real need. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going to walk off and, and that's it. That's the last thought they're going to have about it. Because they have no idea. Yeah. I didn't know there was 30 million people US. in the United States of America. 30 million people in the U.S. that are deaf. I had no idea. Well, I, you know, I, I, God has been speaking to my heart all this week yeah. about this thing. I'm serious, folks. Yeah. Yeah. Man, we, we've lost our burden. Yeah. We've lost our burden. I mean, we have lost it so much, folks, that the ones in our household are no longer on our hearts. Now, I know some of you sit back there and you're about ready to come up here and punch me in the nose and say, I have you to know they are. When's the last time, when's the last time that you sacrificed a, a little bit of your time to spend with God in a closet of prayer on their behalf? When's the last time you didn't even eat for 24 hours? We call it, the Bible calls that fasting. That's right. When's the last time you fasted for your loved ones? Yeah. Now, don't come punching me in the nose. I'll punch back. <laughs> but I'll just punch it with the Word. Let, we don't fast for them anymore. That's right. that, I, and then we say, well, I'm just as burdened as you are. Unless you do these things, we're not burdened. A real burden will drive us to do something. Yeah. Amen? Amen. I mean, a real burden will... These men had a burden for their friend. It wasn't just... I got an idea. You know, old Harry, he's over there lame. I mean, he's in the bed. He's never walked. Why don't we get a couple of our buddies... What an idea just came to me. Why don't we get my, our buddies and go get him and take him to Jesus? Well, it would have stopped right there when the crowd was gathered around. They might would have taken him back home. But that was as far as it would have carried them. They had a burden for their friend. A real burden that caused them to do the unordinary. They Listen, the Bible says 
when they got there and they saw the crowd, rather than taking him back home or laying him down and saying, forget it, they went up on the rooftop. That's not an easy chore. Carrying a man in his bed up on the rooftop. Now, I, I know it wasn't the rooftops like we're used to and accustomed to around here. I understand that. But it's still not an easy chore to get him up the roof. I, I don't know if there was a stairway or whatever. That would have been hard anyway. But they carried him up there. Got him on top of the roof. Now they begin to tear open a hole in the roof. Just tearing it back, laying it back over to the side, over to the side, over to the side. Do you understand they're going to excessive measures to just just get their friend to Jesus? That Listen, they never looked at it like that. I can see them as they say, well, listen, listen, listen we got to. Uh, man, we got to get up digging to Jesus somehow. It's the only hope he's got. We gotta get into Jesus some way. I mean, without him, without us getting into Jesus, this man, he'll just be this way the rest of his life, and that'll be it. Oh, we gotta get into Jesus. Why don't we have that burden for our loved ones? If we don't get them to Jesus, they're gonna die and go to that hell. We read about that rich man in hell being in torments. He's not the only one that's gonna be in hell in torments. Everyone that goes there is gonna be in torments. They're going to be burning and burning and burning and burning and burning. No love. All that's going to be there is hate. Amen. The Bible says weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's not just that rich man. You know who else it is? It's going to be our families yes, it is. that we didn't reach with the gospel. Yeah. It's going to be those deaf people that we didn't have a burden enough about to give a little money. Maybe we have to do without pizza tomorrow. But we didn't care enough. God help us tonight. Folks, listen to me. I'm not expecting you to come up and hug my neck and say thank you for that message. Listen to me. We ought to get a burden for, for lost folks though. Amen. Amen. I mean, they sing about heaven. Brother Danny, I thought surely you'd preach on heaven. Listen, folks, sometimes we need a little hell in our lives. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. I'm telling us, folks, our loved ones, some of us sitting here tonight, our children, our children, your little girl, your little boy is going to be one of those in hell in torment. I know you don't want to think about it, but you better think about it because you're the only hope they have. If you don't care enough, who's going to? Don't, don't put it off on some church in the neighborhood. Don't put it off on a pastor. That's what we pay, paying for. No, that ain't what you're paying for. No, sir. If you don't have the burden for your own family, who do you think is going to have it? There you go. Amen. Amen. They're there. And they, they're realizing, man, we got to do something. They get up there and every time they're doing something to get into Jesus, my friend, they're thinking, boy, we're just... We're just getting closer and closer the whole time. We're about to get him some help. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you, let's just don't stop, man. Let's just keep on. Let's do whatever's necessary. They rip open that rooftop. Jesus is down in that house, maybe in the living room part, and he's preaching to them. The Bible says so. He preached Jesus unto them. He's preaching to them. I can just see all this is going on. I can see some of those folks that are there. What do you think you guys are doing? What? Yeah, there's some kind of nut. I mean, like y'all for being here in the cold weather tonight. There's some kind of nut, amen. Look at them. Look at them. Boy, but you know what? I just see Jesus as he keeps on preaching. He just keeps on preaching. All of a sudden, these men get the hole big enough to let the bed down. That's what the Bible says. It wasn't a little old hole that the man, they slid him down. The Bible says it was a big enough hole that the bed went down through there. And they lowered him down. Man, I mean, they're lowering him down. Can you imagine the people now? Huh? Boy, I mean, some of them are getting all riled up. Because Can you imagine the owner of the house? Huh? 
Boy, sometimes we get folks all riled up just us trying to get folks to Jesus, huh? I mean, some folks around here are getting riled up because we're trying to get folks to Jesus this week. Amen? Hey, it, it gets the devil mad. That's right. The devil don't like it. The devil would have been the one that said, hey, listen, y'all try it, fellas. Give me a high five. Yeah, yeah. Y'all try it. Bless your heart for trying. God will have to reward you for that, huh? But I don't blame you. I'd go on back home now. You done give it to your best shot. I didn't see the devil doing that. But they had a burden. And this burden went beyond that. This burden kept driving them, my friend, to get their friend to Jesus. And they weren't going to stop anything short of getting him to Jesus. Folks, I wish you and I, listen to me. God blesses faithfulness. Not good at whatever you do, but faithfulness. Amen. We think He blesses our talents. But He doesn't. He blesses faithfulness. I found that out a long time ago when I realized He's a blessing to me. Because I ain't good at nothing. But there's one thing I can do, praise God. I can tell you what I can do. I can be faithful. Yeah. I might not have seen. Well, you've been trying to get everybody to listen and see if folks are doing their best at singing. You don't want to hear me sing, let alone my best. <laughs> Amen. But I'm just saying, folks, listen to me. We think God blesses our ability to do this and our ability to... God blesses faithfulness. I can be faithful to God. Amen. Amen. You know what I found out? You can be faithful to God. You know what I found out? You can be faithful to God. I mean, we can go to everybody here. I don't care where you are, what you can do and can't do. Everybody, everybody can be faithful to God. Amen. Right. Amen. God's not looking for great preachers, great singers and all that. He's looking for somebody that loves Him enough that they'll be faithful. A burden will cause you to be faithful. Amen. These men, they were they they had a burden for this man, and it caused them to be faithful to the task that they had they were to do. That was to get their friend to Jesus. There was nothing going to stop them from getting their friend to Jesus. I got a feeling if somebody had to stop them from getting on the rooftop, uh, if, if the roof had been in such a way that they couldn't carry it open, they'd have found some other way to have got their friend to Jesus. Listen, what have you been what, what what have you been looking at? How have you been looking at your situation and saying, Lord, just help me to find a way to get my loved ones to you? We give up so easy. I've heard so many people tell me, Well, I've got a brother. He's lost. I've been praying for him twenty years. Preacher, I, I'm just, I've just come to the conclusion, I hate to say it, but I don't believe he's ever going to get saved. Really? Are you serious? My friend, listen to me. I've got a sister that I witnessed to. She, when she got saved, she was 71 years old. And this was uh, about six years ago. And she was 71 years old. Miss Pam and I, well, I witnessed to her before Pam and I ever got saved, but when we got saved, we lived in Michigan down the road from her. And Pam and I would go to her house, her and her husband's house, and we would talk with them about Jesus. And we'd try to talk to them and tell them about how they needed to be saved. And they'd always come back with this. We're all right. We go to church, and they did. I mean, they did. now they were faithful. They went every Christmas and every Easter. <laughs> Amen. They were faithful. They went every Christmas and every Easter. And we tried to tell them about Jesus. Oh, we're all right. We're all right. And this went on. Listen, Pam and I lived up there the first five years of our marriage. We witnessed to them all the time. Tried to. They'd always cut us off. And then, then I went down to Alabama and pastored for 24 years. And the whole 24 years, every summer, we'd take a trip up to Michigan 
And we, because Pam's family was up there, and we'd go by my sister's house, and we'd try to witness to her and her husband. And again, we're all right. Now we're talking about 29 years have come and gone. God put us into evangelism. One day we're down in Texas. We're in a revival meeting in Texas. My sister calls me from Michigan, and she begins to cry and tell me she just got out of the hospital. Uh, she's got emphysema and uh, uh, thanks to smoking. Of course, I know there's nothing wrong with it, but she's dying of emphysema. Amen. Amen. You don't think there's something wrong with that. Something's wrong with you. Amen. But she's, she's, got the, she's having to pull this little bottle of oxygen around with her where she goes now. And she's crying. And I can't hardly understand her because... I mean, she's having a struggle even with that little tube in her nose. And we're talking over the phone. And I'm once again trying to tell her about the Lord Jesus Christ. And she says, Danny, I'm okay. I've told you I'm okay. I said, would you do me a favor? I said, you tell me you're okay. What does that mean? She said, well, it means what you're trying to ask me. Am I saved? She said, that's what it means. I said, well, let me ask you, are you saved? She said, well, yes, I am. I'm okay. She always said, I'm okay. I said, Doris, I said, tell me about when you got okay. So she told me. She said, when I was a teenage girl, I went to church. She said they were having a revival down there around our house. And she said, I went to church. And she said, the, the preacher priest, they give an invitation. And she said, there was about 10 or 12 young people in the church. We were all sitting together. One of them went. Another one went. That ended up, all of us went down to the altar. We, we got down there. And when we got down to the altar, we're all just standing across the front there. And said the pastor said, y'all sit on the front row. You know how it usually is in a Baptist church. It's always empty. And said, y'all, just sit down here. And so they all sat down. And he walked across them just like this right here. And he said, now, you came to be saved. You came to be saved. And you came to be saved. Let me pray with y'all. And he prayed. He prayed the sinner's prayer. I, I've never found the sinner's prayer in the Bible, by the way. That's right. Yep. Yep. Amen. Amen. But he prayed what we call the sinner's prayer. God forgive me. I know I'm a sinner and I ask you to come into my heart and say, he prayed the sinner's prayer. And then he went back down the line telling him, now you, now you got saved tonight. You trusted the Lord as your Savior. And, no, and she told me about that. Uh -huh. And I said, so if you were to die right now, now you know the doctor's only given you a few months to live. If you were to die right now, would heaven be your home? And she said, well, I don't know that for sure. Yeah. And I said, can I tell you about, about my salvation? She said, yes. Now, we're on the phone from Michigan to Texas. And I said, well, first of all, let me just tell you, I've got to be honest with you, I don't think I'm saved. Yeah. Boy, it was quiet on the phone. And finally she said to me, Danny, I've heard you preach, and you've always preached that you know for sure that you're saved that you know when you die, heaven's going to be your home. That you're as sure for heaven now as if you were already there. And she said, and you're telling me you don't know? I said, I, no, I'm telling you. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not uh, it's not like that. She said, what? I don't understand. I said, well, what you've got is a confusing salvation. You, you've got it, but you ain't sure you got it. But you're all right. She said, well... I thought that's the way it was for everybody. I said, Doris, listen to me. Let me tell you. I don't think I got saved. I said, March the 27th, 1969, when I went to that altar, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. We don't think so about it. I know so. And I said, that's the difference, Doris. I said, if you ask me, just go ahead and ask me, Danny, if you were to die today, do you know for sure heaven would be your home? And she said, okay. Danny, if you were to die today, do you know for sure heaven will be your home? I said, I sure do, Lord, because I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen. She prayed and asked the Lord to save her on that phone. She's, listen to me, that was about six years ago. She's still alive. She don't pull a little cart around her. Of course, she don't do this either. But she don't pull that little cart around with her anymore. Amen. And by the way, this is not what will send you to hell. That's right. Okay? She don't do none of that stuff. As a matter of fact, she's a going to church faithfully, not just Christmas and Easter. She's going to a Baptist church every Sunday. Amen. 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 
Well, I'm telling you, folks, listen to me. We don't need to come up short. We don't need to let anything stop us from just being a witness, being a witness, being a witness. And there never comes a time where we can say no. I just don't think they'll ever get saved. I can see these men. They're tearing open the rooftop. One of them may have said, Man, I tell you what, I, I'm tired. I, I, think we just, I think we just went as far as we need to go with this thing. Uh, we're getting... We're getting carried away. We're letting this thing kind of take over our life. We've got other things that we need to be doing. One of them might have said it. I don't think so. But one of them could have. And the others would have joined in and said, Oh, no, no. We're bringing our friend. He's crippled. He can't walk. His only hope is Jesus Christ. They're lowering the bed down there. Jesus just keeps preaching. Folks are looking around. They're amazed at what's going on. All of a sudden, this man, I can just see his... As it's coming down, Jesus just keeps preaching to the folks. And I believe they had this thing. God put it where when they let that bed down, I believe it came right down in front of where Jesus was standing. And the Bible says, and when Jesus saw their faith, now we don't believe in this, but the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, you look at your Bible. That's what your Bible says if it's a King James Bible. And if it's not a King James Bible, I don't care what it says. Amen. Yeah. But the King James Bible says, And when Jesus saw their faith, He saith unto the sick of the palsy, Amen. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Amen. When Jesus saw you know, their faith, how did He see their faith? Well, he saw those ropes. It was tied to the bed and up there to their hand. That wasn't what showed him their faith. He saw their faith by the fact they had brought him to where Jesus was. That was their faith. They believed so much that if they could get their friend to where Jesus was, he'd be made whole. They believed that so much that they went to to the extremes to get Jesus, or get this man to where Jesus was. Folks, I don't know that we've got enough faith. We're, we don't even have enough to get them to where Jesus is. We're, we're thinking they'll never get saved. You know why? Because you and I will never have enough faith to get them saved. You say, no, wait, Brother Danny, it's not your faith and it's not my faith. The Bible says when he saw their faith, God works when there's faith. That's right. Amen. He works when there's faith. And now Jesus says to the, the sick of the palsy, He says to him, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Here's the crowd, the self-righteous crowd sitting over there. And they're beginning to, the Bible says, reason in their hearts. Amen. That's one of the worst things we can start doing is start reasoning. We always reason Jesus out of the picture. But they said, Who can forgive sins but God only? Who can well, I agree with that. The Bible is very plain. Only Jesus Christ can forgive us of our sins. Oh, I'm telling you them, as, as they're saying these things, they're murmuring, by the way. They're not saying it out loud. They're kind of behind Jesus' back. They're kind of murmuring back and forth where Jesus came here. You know what? He knows every murmur that goes on. He picks up on it, every bit of it. As a matter of fact, he doesn't miss a word. He doesn't mix it up. He's got it down exactly what we murmur and say. Even when we don't say it, He still knows what we're thinking. That's what the Bible says. Better watch out. Better watch out. Amen. But hey, Jesus says, let, let me read it. I don't want to mess it up here. The Bible says there in verse number uh, 9, Whether it be easy to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up the, thy bed and walk. But, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. Boy, Jesus, can you see these men? They're up on the rooftop. This man's down in front of Jesus. My friend Jesus has is, is, is reached out to heal him. I mean, he has spoken the words, and this man's healed. 
And these men are up on the rooftop. I wonder what they're doing. Can you see them as they're up there? Use your spiritual imagination. Amen? God gave us one, you know. We get to talking about heaven. We get excited. Why? Because of our spiritual imagination. Amen. Can you see these men up there on the rooftop? I see them as they're lowering their friend down. They're lowering him down. They say, just, just a little farther. Just a little farther. Come on, man. No, don't stop now. We're just a little bit more. We're just about to get him in front of Jesus. And they're easing that rope down. All of a sudden, they get him right there in front of Jesus. I don't know if they lowered it all the way down on the floor. The Bible doesn't say. But I kind of imagine that they did. They let him right, rest right down on the floor. They're up there. Why? Why did they? I, I think they laid him down on the floor because they knew Jesus was going to heal him. Yeah. They had that faith. Oh, yeah. They wanted to be free. They didn't want to be attached to anything that keep them from praising God. Right. Unlike you and I. We're attached to a lot of things. Some of it is our sins that keeps us from rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the reason a lot of folks say, I don't believe in doing this. You know why they don't? Because they got their hands full of the world. Don't want to turn loose. I think these, these men had enough foresight or faith, I would, would call it, to know that when they get him down there, Jesus is going to do what they told that man he's going to do. They believe. They really believe that. Amen? Amen. And so they've let him down there and they've just turned her loose of the rope. And Jesus is speaking to him. And then when he said, uh, I believe when he said, Thy sins be forgiven thee, I believe those four men up on top of that thing started having a revival meeting. Yeah. I believe they started shouting and rejoicing. Amen. And then when Jesus said, uh, uh, To arise and take up thy bed and walk, and they looked, and this man got off the bed, picked up the bed, Stuck it up under his arm and starts out of the house with it. I see these men as they're rejoicing up there on the rooftop. They're praising the Lord. I mean, they're thanking God for Jesus. I mean, listen, this thing has come to pass. The very thing they prayed for, they hoped for, they worked for, has come to pass. And then the crowd, look what the crowd has got to say about this. I'm telling you, folks, if we ever get hooked up with Jesus like we think we are, if we really get hooked up, we're going to have a time. The Bible says that immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all in so much that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, listen to me. We've got God figured out, don't we? We know exactly how He's going to do things and when He's going to do it. And we have no idea. We have no idea. We, we, we do. We've got God figured out so much that we've limited Him. He can only work in this direction. And He can only do certain things. Well, we're Baptists. We believe the book. And we've read it that, oh, that He's going to only work certain ways. Let me tell you something about God. He has no strings attached to Him. Yeah. He's not a puppet. Dance now, God. Yeah. He's not. God can do anything. Listen, Amen. God, God can do this. God can save that lost family member, that lost friend of yours, yonder at their house. Amen. And you're here. God can save them. I'm talking about tonight. While we're under this tent and they're at home, God can save them. You say, well, why don't He? Well, why don't we have faith? Why don't we believe? My friend, listen to me. We just, we just don't have that burden enough to really believe God just to come and lay it on the altar and really believe God. And, and when we do, we, we feel like this. God, I want you to save them. And what we're saying is, I want you to save them now because if you don't save them now, I'm not going to carry this burden any longer. Yeah. Amen. I wonder how many times these men went over to that old boy and said, we got to figure a way to get Jesus to you. We just got to get, we got to figure a way. This Jesus, he's, he, he's done all these miracles. Let me tell you, and I believe they've witnessed to him and told him about the great things that the Lord has done. And they're saying, we've got to figure out a way. And I believe they prayed over this thing. I believe they, they worked toward this thing and trying to figure it out. 
And then when they found out, praise the Lord, Jesus is just down the street, they realized this is our opportunity. God's given us an opportunity to get our friend to Jesus. Well, you and I are a, a burden. We don't really know what a burden We think a burden is something that gets us down and discouraged. What's wrong with you? I'm burdened. I'm so burdened. You know what I found out? Sometimes a burden is when when you think you get to praying for someone. And I mean, you got their name down and you're praying for them and you're praying for them and you're praying for them. And the more you pray for them, the more burden you get. And all of a sudden you realize something. Boy, you're, now you're burdened, so burdened for them, you're rejoicing. You say, what? You're, well, you're saying, I know that they're going to be saved. Praise the Lord. It's just a matter of time. I've been praying. God, I believe that they're going to come to you one day and they're going to ask you and you're going to save them, Lord. And you're going to give them this life eternal that you've given me. Lord, and it's going to be so wonderful. God, I can hardly wait. That's a burden. That's a burden. Amen. We ought to be burdened that way. I, I don't believe these men grabbed up that bed. Oh, come on. Well, what's wrong with you? I'm burdened for him. I believe they're so burdened on the way down the road to that house. They're rejoicing. Talking about maybe they were singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Amen. But they knew this. If they could get their friend to Jesus. It's all right. The Bible says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air, so he's always trying to mess up things. Amen. But if we could just get our loved ones to Jesus, if you're lost tonight, I wish I could convince you to come to Jesus. Because He's all you need. Right. I'm telling you, He's all you need tonight is just Jesus Christ. Right. I, I'm both listen to me. It's going to get a lot worse than this in this world. You better know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Right. He better be the rock that you're on. The Bible tells us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Right. Folks, listen to me. I'm telling you, we better get we better get on our on the solid rock of Jesus Christ tonight that we can stand when the troubles of life come. If you're lost tonight, you need to come and trust this Jesus that we've been trying to preach to you about, trying to encourage you about. My friend, because He's the only one that can give you hope. The only hope this man had was not his four friends. The only hope he had was in Jesus Christ. Right, man. The only hope these four men had was not in him, but their only hope was in Jesus Christ. I'm telling you tonight, if you don't know him as your Savior, you need to, you need to come and trust him tonight as your Savior. Right, right. And then, Christians, if you are really saved, let, let me stop it. If you're not sure, if you're just okay, you need to come and get saved. Amen. 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 My friend, if you are saved tonight, you ought to ask God to burden your heart. God may have to break it in order to burden it. Amen. I mean break it to where there's no more pride in your life. He strips you down to just who you are and that's nothing. And then He says, now here I am. Trust in me. Follow me. And we need to come to Him and follow Him, Christians. And obey Him. There's a lot more men out here, a lot more women that need Jesus. There's a lot more Morgans at 14 years old that need Jesus. Amen. There's a lot more of all ages that need Jesus. There's a lot more death that need Jesus. Folks, listen, aren't you? And God has chosen us. God chose those four men to go get this man to bring to Jesus. Boy, what a blessing that must have been to be one of them. And God's chosen you and I to, to help this death ministry to go reach more death. Amen. God has chosen us. If you're a member of this church, God's chosen you to, to make sure this church stands and preaches the Word of God and is able to reach out in this community and reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. What a blessing. God has chosen mom. God's chosen you to reach out to that son or that daughter tonight and win them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Dad, God's chosen you to reach out to that son or that daughter tonight and, and win them to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, folks, listen. God's chosen us tonight, if we're saved, to reach out, to be that link between Him and lost man to get them to Jesus. 
what are we going to do? We just going to give it a little effort and give up, or we going to ask God to burden our heart, burden our heart, and then rejoice when we get home. They're singing about it tonight, and someone says, "Hey, I want to thank you. I don't even know who you are. I want to thank you for giving to the Lord." I'm alive that was changed. Yeah. Amen. 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 Folks, listen to me tonight. This is a serious matter. We need to be about the Father's business. Going and getting the lost. You say, well, how do you know that's His business? That's the business that, that's at hand. That's the reason Jesus left heaven right. and came to earth that He might seek and save that which was lost. Right. Now He's asking us to get the lost to come that they might hear and be saved. Won't you come tonight? Let's all stand. Everyone standing with your head bowed and your eye closed. Would you obey the Lord tonight? Would you listen to God tonight? Obey His voice tonight? Not to me, but listen to God. Would you do that tonight? Would you Would you obey Him? Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Everything's going to be alright. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. I'm telling you folks, listen. The devil is not happy with what's going on here. The devil's not happy with what he's doing everything he can to distract. I'm serious. He's doing everything he can to distract. Don't don't listen to me. Don't get caught up in that. God's wanting to speak your heart, do a work in your heart tonight. Won't you let him? Won't you let him tonight? If you're lost, why don't you come tonight? Pastor standing up here with me. Why don't you come tonight and tell the pastor, Pastor, I want to be saved. Pastor, I need to trust the Lord as my Savior. I want to be saved. Preacher, would you pray with me? Why don't you come and tell him tonight? Come on tonight. And then, Christian friend, why don't you flood this altar tonight and say, God, give me a burden for lost souls. Give me a, help me to be a friend like those four men were. God, I want to be a friend like they were that cares enough about those friends of mine that will tell them about Jesus. Even when it's not popular, even when they don't want to hear, I want to still tell them about you. Would you come and pray tonight, Christian? Maybe you've got a son or a daughter you need to bring by faith to an altar of prayer and pray for them. Maybe you've got a grandson or a granddaughter, or maybe more than one or two. Maybe tonight you need to come and kneel in an old-fashioned altar. Would you come tonight? Even if you're a visitor, this is not just for for this, uh, members only, but you can use this altar tonight without feeling like you're making a commitment to this church. This is just a place to pray. Would you come? Would you come tonight? Do business with God. Father, Lord, we want to thank you tonight, God, for your son. Lord, I feel like I've done a, a terrible job of preaching this message tonight. But Lord, at the same time, God, I've done all I could do. Lord, I, I, I just pray that you would take this God, I pray you'll apply it to our hearts and lives. I pray, dear God, for that man that's standing there right now, just kind of within himself, shrugging his shoulders and saying, uh, this, this is not for me. I pray tonight, God, that you'd take it and just take it right to their heart and make them realize, Lord, this is for them. They're the one that can make a difference in others' lives. Even if it's only one other life that they change. Lord, I know you'll be doing the changing, but if, if they just reach one soul, Lord, it'll be one soul that doesn't have to die and go to a devil's hell. Lord, I pray for that woman that's standing here tonight. And she too is just at the point, Lord, of just giving up and saying there's just no use and I'm not going to try anymore. Lord, I pray tonight you'd help her to realize, Father, God, that she needs to let her light shine even more now in this old dark world. God, that others might see you in her. I pray, Lord, that we'd get a, a real burden tonight for the lost, Lord, around about us. Even uh, those that we don't even know, Lord, that we've not met yet, but we come in contact with at the grocery store or the gas station or somewhere that we might go to a restaurant or something. Lord, and just, a, just a little bit of a witness of how good you are, Lord. Sometimes that's all it takes. God, this week we've got this revival. We could be reaching out to others with this and saying, won't you come? Go to an old-fashioned tent meeting with you. Lord, I pray tonight, God, that you give us a burden. Break our hearts, Lord. God, wake us up tonight after we get home and we're going to bed like everything's the way it's always been. I pray, God, that you'll burden our heart. I pray we'll see our own loved ones burning in the devil's hell. 
They'll be the one that's weeping. They'll be the one that's wailing. They'll be the one that's gnashing their teeth because they're so mad at the fact that they never trusted you as their Savior. They'll be eat up with so much hatred there in hell, Lord. They'll be uncontrollable, but that'll be all right because they'll be in that place. God, I pray tonight, Lord, that you'd help us to realize, Father, Lord, that they could be our loved ones. God, if we don't reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, you're the only hope they have. The only hope. God, would you help us tonight to be burdened for them? Lord, we want to just ask you right now to speak to us in Jesus' name we pray. Let's keep our heads bowed as the organist begins to play. Would you come? You don't have to. You don't have to come. But you can. You can. The least we can do is come and pray. Amen. You can tonight. The devil says you can. But you can't. Well, well, my question is, what good is it going to do? Well, let me ask you, what good did it do for those four men? For those four men to go by and get that old man that couldn't even walk? He wasn't worth 15 cents. He couldn't even get up off the bed. What good did it do? Well, we see it changed his life. From that point on, it changed his life. My friend, tonight a prayer can change a life. Won't you come tonight? Won't you come? God's doing a work in hearts. Would you come and let Him do a work in yours? He's wanting your heart tonight. You say, Brother Dan, I, I'm nothing. God picks on nothing because that's what we all are is nothing. And God chooses the nothing to make something out of it. Amen. Won't you come tonight? Let Him have His way in your heart and in your life. Would you step out and come tonight? Just step out in spite of all that the devil is doing to keep you from coming tonight. Why don't you just come? I, you ought to, tonight, you ought to let a little of that stubbornness be on the devil's part. And just be so stubborn, I'm not going to listen to the devil. I'm going to obey God tonight. And I'm going to go, Mr. Devil, you can go with me if you want to, but I'm going to Jesus. Why don't you just do that tonight? Aren't you tired of the devil pushing you around and messing your life up? bringing chaos into your life. I mean, just seemingly destroying everybody and everything you love. Well, why don't you get fed up with it tonight and come to Jesus? Amen. Won't you come to Jesus tonight? You don't have to, but you can. Why don't you come to Him tonight? We're waiting just a little while longer. Would you join us in this altar of prayer? Pastor. with their heads bowed and their eyes closed, or just sing that first verse with me of Just As I Am, without one plea, you know it. You do not need the book. You don't need the words. Just sing it with me. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Sing it with me now. Just as I am. Uh, preaching, I thought of something uh, that I'd never really thought about before. You know, when Jesus touched someone that had an infirmity, it was always considered a miracle. When he fed the 5,000, we look at that and say, a miracle. As I was sitting there, I was thinking about 
those four men bringing their friend to Jesus. The Bible says that they lowered that man down with some ropes. Usually, the ropes on those beds were just enough to wrap your hand around to carry somebody. They weren't long. Did you ever stop to think, like when they were feeding the 5,000 and the bread and the fish just kept coming and coming, that as they dropped that man, the rope just kept extending Amen. and extending Amen. and extending <laughs> and extending? Amen. Man, that's, that's crazy. But that wouldn't surprise me at all. Amen. And maybe the rope only got so far and that poor man's looking up saying, that's it? And Jesus said, you can let go now. Then the man was lowered to the ground. Perhaps. I don't know. And then Jesus said, your faith. That was good. Yes. That was good. That's good preaching. And then I was thinking, Christmas and Easter, right? People, twice a year, two-timers. You can't trust a two-timer, can you? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm sorry, I just think you're crazy. So. I don't know, you're doing strange things to me. I don't know if it's good for you to be around me or not. This is, this is good. Jack, won't you come take the offering? Would you please read it? Won't you come sing for the offering? You don't? No, no, that's all right. We're good. Yeah, I did. He just forgot. Okay, all right. Oh, just kidding. Senior moment, yeah. Ain't God good? Amen. I tell you, I love Brother Danny. I'm thankful that uh, he's he's um, yields to the Holy Spirit. I didn't tell you guys to come up here. I'm just kidding. You can stay. Uh, I've known Danny since 1991. And uh, I'm not saying his preaching gets better. I'm saying that he's more yielded to the Holy Spirit the older that he gets. And as you live for the Lord and you strive to serve the Lord, you'll begin to understand what I'm saying. Because when you uh, uh, are yielded to the Holy Spirit of God, He can flow through you. And it can touch the lives of people. And thank you, Brother Danny, that you were obedient to the Lord tonight as well as the other days as well. And um, Brother Adams and Brother Adam and Tiki, you guys uh, have just been a phenomenal blessing to us. And uh, we love you. Sincerely. Sincerely. Yeah, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah there you go. I have problems with my nose sometimes. But, uh, anyways, Brother Gary, I want you to come up here a minute. Yeah, that, you, you, Brother Gary, Doug, or whatever you answer to. When I first met Brother Gary, I kept calling him Doug, so he answers to either one. So his real name's Gary. This is a man of God right here. He's quiet. You don't hear much from him. I had to make you walk up here. But he is a man of God. He is founded in the Word of God. I trust this guy with everything. I mean that. He, he's a good man. He's got a great wife, Joanne. Everybody turn around and look at her. Wait, put your arm up there. She's a great, godly woman. Been serving the Lord many, many years. I want you to pray for the offering, Brother Gary. And then I got something special I want to do tonight. Your heads, please. Kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you that we can come boldly before your throne through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for the power that it has, that it saves us, that it keeps us. Lord, I thank you for the promise of your return. And Lord, I thank you that it appears that we're in the last days. I pray that we be prepared. Lord, that we would preach the word. Lord, I thank you for the strong preaching we've heard tonight and all week. And I pray that you would allow us to work in our hearts, and guide and direct us to be more bold with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with this offering. Be with the one that has to give and the one that has not. And we'll ask all these things in Jesus' name for us sake. Amen.
you know, while they're taking the offering up, Brother Danny, you preached and you talked about how the influence that a mom and dad have on their children. And there's a couple here tonight that had great influence on uh, one of their children. I know for a fact one of their children. And that would be uh, Leo and Helen uh, uh, Lanham. And what I want to do, uh, I want, I'd like, Leo, would you go over there and help Mrs. Lanham come up here to the front? Maybe, Reba, you can help. And uh, Brother Ron, you come up here, please. Be obedient. <laughs> you stand up here with your mom and dad, will you? You know, I, I've known I've known Helen and, and Leo for quite some time. I've known yeah. Pastor Ron for I think we figured thirty seven years now. And I don't believe I don't believe without Leo and Helen, especially Helen. No, brother Leo too. I, I don't believe that Pastor Ron would be the pastor that he is. I believe that. I mean, Pastor Ron's been through an awful lot in his life, and he's stayed true to God. And I believe because of parents like that. I really do. And Brother Danny, I know your children. My wife and I know your children very, very well. And they're godly young people. And I praise God for that. And I praise God for your parents, brother. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I was the first Christian in our family. And I'm thankful, though, that I got saved, and many of my family members are now saved. But praise God, your mom and dad were saved, trained you up in the admonition of the Lord. And I don't know how you were going to close the meeting tonight, but I'd like for you to face everybody, all four of you. And I want everybody to come up here and, and give them a hug around the neck, love on them a little bit, and tell, them, tell Leo and Helen how thankful you are for our pastor. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to have a word of prayer. I want you to make your way up here and uh, give these folks a hug around the neck and let them know you love them. Father God, we thank you uh, tonight for uh, Pastor uh, Lanham. We pray that, God, you would anoint him with your Holy Spirit with power. We thank you for his precious mom and dad. Uh, Lord, how that you have um, you raised them up to raise him up. And we're so thankful that he listened and was willing to be obedient to them and, and God to be obedient to you and that one day he called upon you to save him. And all he's trying to do, God, is get more people in the kingdom of heaven, trying to disciple people, not trying to upset anybody, just trying to love people. And we're thankful for that. We thank you for Reba tonight. We thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, she, she loves you and wants to sing uh, for your glory and for your honor. Now, God, as we leave here tonight, keep us safe. And thank you for Brother Adams and, and all the folks with him. We love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on up here. And, come on up.